So this afternoon I'd like to talk to you about um, making the change to robotic milking at the University of Connecticut. A little bit of background on the farm. Uh, the cows are milked three times a day in a De La Val double four herringbone parlor with uh, milk weights and ID beginning in 1991. And in 2013 with an upgrade we also added the ability to detect blood and conductivity in the milking parlor. Our milking herd consists of 90 cows, 65 registered Holsteins, and 25 registered Jerseys, and we do participate in Holstein Complete and Classify every seven months. In May, in uh, spring of 2018, the university purchased two De Laval Classic VMS, uh, two swinging cow brushes, the activity system, and a robotic feed pusher. On May 1st of 2018, we began the process and started to push cows through the robots once a day for grain. On May 15th, two weeks later, at 4 a.m., we milked the cows in the parlor for, last time, for the last time, and at 10 a.m., uh, started milking in the robots. And at that point, our parlor was decommissioned. Um, our treated cows are milked in a tie saw barn with bucket milker. We didn't run tie, uh, treated cows through the parlor, and we don't run them through the robots either. Uh, the addition to house the two robots was added at the end of the existing freestall barn. Freestall size is bigger on the north side of the barn, so second lactation and older Holsteins are housed there in Jersey and first lactation Holsteins are housed on the south side. Our barn is free flow with no gates. Uh, there are one-way finger gates for each robot holding area to work with red cows um, that need to be fetched. And our barn's obviously a retrofit, which represents its own unique set of challenges. The biggest one being, I think, you know, there's a narrow walkway behind the cows that are eating at the bunk and between there and the free stalls, so that can prevent a timid cow from going up through to the robot to be milked. We've also noticed that when the finger gates are down during fetch times, timid cows are reluctant to enter the commitment area if the boss cows are in there. A little bit about our cows. So as you might imagine in the university herd, these cows are handled a lot and some of them are pets. They've all probably been shown once or twice by students in one of the two student shows we have on campus every year. Not necessarily um, always conducive to cows moving to the robot in a free flow system. So the Jerseys and the younger Holstein cows do really well moving to the robot on their own. Um, some older cows are fetch cows. That is what it is. And uh, Chris Duffy is always quick to remind me when I get discouraged about that, that those cows probably will weed themselves out over the next few years and not to worry about it. And the, probably the, one of the more interesting things about the herd is it's no longer a herd mentality for the cows. When we were milking in the parlor, if you went to the pen to get a cow or two up, the, the other cows around them would get up to go with them. And we saw that change within the first two to three weeks after startup with the robots. Now you can walk out there, get a particular cow that you want to send to the robot, and she goes by herself, and none of the others around her feel compelled to do so. And the really nice part about with the robots is the cows in the barn are really quiet. So the transition to the robots was much easier for the cows than the people. Um, you know, it was a big change for people that had worked at the university for 30 years and milked in a parlor three times a day to go to a free flow robot, but we're working on it. Um, and robots don't take the place of really good cow people. We still need good cow people to have their eyes on the cows when they're walking uh, to fetch cows and get fresh cows that we need to work with. And we also, you know, grooming stalls is of utmost importance as far as milk quality goes. So we basically manage the free stall as a tie stall barn. When you're walking the pens to fetch cows, you groom the stalls at the same time. Anything that's wet or dirty comes off the back, fresh sawdust comes to the back of the stall. These cows will move better when left alone to do so, but if the people, you know, if the farm staff wants to stand there and send one cow at a time to the robots, that's what they'll let you do. They'll stand there and wait for their human to come and send them, which defeats the purpose of the robot. So we had to work on that with the people a little bit. Service and support are really important to me. It's not my farm business, but I am responsible 24 hours a day. And we receive exceptional support from Hanfield Dairy Equipment and De Lavelle, and uh, somebody always answers the phone if there's a problem. I can't even begin to tell you uh, the support that, and the help that Dr. Mike Brook at Kansas State has given me uh, from nutrition questions uh, and overall really good robot coach and helpful with troubleshooting along the way. We <clears throat> were not able to put up a new grain bin for the robot addition, so we're actually augering robot pellet from along quite a distance from the existing grain bin to the robot addition. So we found out very early on that pe pellet quality is critical and the cows don't want to eat fines. So if we don't have a good pellet 
and there are a lot of fines. You can see visits drop, pellet intake drops, and then mill production drops. We've also found that starch levels in the PMR can't be really any higher than 22% in order for our cows to move to the robot. We do weekly dry matters on corn silage and adjust the ration accordingly. This is the monitor board from Delpro. And that will refresh if you hit the refresh button so you get up to the minute information. This is a picture I took yesterday morning. So the 87 cows were at 90 pounds and that includes the 21 jerseys that we're milking. Um, you can see that the cows over here are eating 9.39 pounds of robot pellet a day and 2.66 visits per cow per day. Um, as far as the, uh, the things that we look at here, um, We get very detailed information on every cow, quarter milk yield, blood, conductivity, activity, low and high, um, low probably being the more important thing to find sick cows. Mastitis detection index, which takes into account um, intervals between milkings, increases in conductivity, increased kickoffs, or decreased yield in, e in a quarter. Incomplete cows, again, cows that may be off on their milk or kicking, there may be a problem. Uh, cows to motivate and cows to fetch. The nicest part for me is the alerts and notifications come to my phone instantly through the My Farm app within two to three seconds after the cows exiting the robot. Um, and I can look anytime through the app or log in through Log Me In to check on things and see how things are going. Um, from the robot touch screens, the farm staff can look at incomplete cow lists, bring them back in the robot to be checked, check with a CMT paddle. When the students are there at night, I think it's good practice for them. And usually if they find a cow that's off on our milk, I usually have them temper and do a physical so they get into the habit of doing so um, as part of their learning process. Herd Navigator is something that we started sampling with on September 1st of 2019. Um, Herd Navigator is a biomodel sampling program which is complex and dynamic. There's three models involved, reproduction, mastitis, and ketosis. The consumable cost per cow per year is approximately $90. For, re for the reproduction part is progesterone sampling and any cows that are marked as calls will not be sampled. Um, we start sa they start sampling at 20 days in milk and end it, and at any point after that up to 320 days in milk. After calving, cows sampled for progesterone every seven to eight days. As the lactation evolves, time between samples is reduced, and when a cow reaches 50 days in milk, it will sample her every three days. Once progesterone levels reach five nanograms per mil, the model will know that the cow is cycling and should be in heat eight to 12 days later, so sampling frequency increases. As soon as the progesterone drop is detected, a new sample will be taken at the next milking to accurately, accurately detect heat, and normally, it takes 15 samples per cycle. So after a heat alarm, the, sample, the model will sample around day five and nine. If after day nine, progesterone values stay above five nanograms per mil, the model will assume a follicular cyst is developing and then samples are taken every second day to monitor the cyst. I will tell you that Herd Navigator has been 100% accurate in detecting follicular cysts at UConn. Prolonged and estrous cows are put on a cedar sink protocol. If progesterone is high at day 25, the luteal cyst risk will start increasing and cows will be placed on an alarm list. Obstinct cows will end up on this list. Uh, herd Navigator doesn't particularly like Obstinct and that the, the hormone injections mess with the bio model because you're telling the cow to do things that <coughs> Navigator thinks it shouldn't be doing right now or changing the pattern from what the cow would normally be doing. So I stopped Obstincting any cows uh, November 10th and have just been breeding exclusively off of natural heats. Um, our preg rate is up to 30, and I have not had to cedar sink a cow yet for anestrus. The cows are, we're, and not, we're, we're detecting both with visual heat and with herd navigator, but even some older cows that show no sign of visual heat have been bred and are confirmed pregnant with yesterday's herd check. Um, as far as pregnancy goes, once a cow has been inseminated after a heat alarm, Navigator will, Navigator will still sample for progesterone around day five, nine, 14, and 18. At day 30, it will sample every five days. 
Around day 35, we'll, we'll issue a pregnancy alert and continue to sample every five days until day 55 to verify that the cow is still pregnant. If progesterone is, remains high, then it will stop sampling. <coughs> Abortions. So if at any point between 35 and 55 days after insemination, the progesterone sample goes below 10 nanograms per mil, the system will ask for a sample of the next milking. If still low, the cow is placed on the abortion alarm list. So we, it's also been 100% accurate on this that two cows came up as aborting between day 35 and 55, and they were, in fact, checked open on a sub subsequent herd check. Um, and if you see a pregnant cow acting like she's in heat, you just can go in and request a sample and see what's going on. Urea. Um, the herd split into four groups. First, lactation, day 14 to day uh, to 140 day in milk, and then 141 to 300 days in milk. And then second lactation, the grouping is the same. Um, herd navigator will sample four random cows per group per day, and they're taken on the these samples are taken on the first milking of the day. Individual group urea levels are calculated every day. Each value corresponds to a four-day rolling herd average for the group. Results below 8.4 or above 14 alarm, and then you know you need to talk to your nutritionist about addressing the issues. Ketosis. So during the first 20 days, when ketosis risk is highest, cows are sampled daily. After 20 days in milk, they're sampled every four days. If at any point BHB, BHB level increases suddenly, ketosis risk will increase, and the system will request a new sample at the next milking. Sudden milk drops will also cause the system to request a sample. When ketosis risk goes above the defined alarm threshold, the system will issue a ketosis alarm. Cows will be sampled every milking until the risk falls below alarm level, and then it will return to a normal sampling pattern. So when a cow initially alarms, maybe her risk percent is only 38 or 40. Um, I don't run out and treat them right away. We typically will watch and see over the next 24 to 36 hours and see if the risk increases and if her milk production drops, then obviously she needs to be treated. Sometimes they can fix themselves and move on and they don't need to be treated. So initially, probably I was a little anxious out of the gate and maybe treated a couple cows that we didn't need to treat for ketosis right away, but watch and see is okay. If obviously they alarm and the risk is very high, then they need, you know, they need to be checked out and they need to be treated. Mastitis. So during the first 30 days in milk, the cows will be sampled daily for LDH, and after that, sampled every two and a half to three days. If at any point LDH level increases suddenly, mastitis risk will increase, and the system will request a new sample at the next milking. A sudden drop in milk or change in quarter conductivity will also trigger a sample. So our primary primary mastitis issue is with Klebsiella mastitis. So, and those cows for us fall into two distinct groups. One cow that's um, really sick and in declining health, and she, you know, she needs us to intervene and follow our veterinary approved treatment protocols. Sometimes those things happen. Quarter, quarter conductivity will increase, but the cow's not off on her milk, and she doesn't appear to be sick. And we found that self-curing in those types of cases actually works the best. So that's what we do. So it's, again, it's a waiting and seeing and, you know, observing the cows and see what course of action we need to take. 